one of my favorite basketball players was Kobe Bryant. And the reason being is he was not, he had some natural gifts, but he was not as naturally gifted as some of the other players. He just worked really hard in his skills. He was in the gym all the time, kind of practicing, prepping, practicing, prepping. And no, he didn't make every shot, but man, he, he felt confident going up there and taking it. And he took every shot as if he was going to make it because he practiced it. And so that's the word for the day. Control what you can control. Let the rest fall where it may. Welcome to the Financial Freedom Mastermind Group Podcast. Here we're all about breaking free from the 40 to 50 year work grind and accelerating our journey towards financial freedom. Join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern as we explore different types of investments that can fast track your path to financial independence. We serve as a hub for connecting with fellow members during our sessions so you can share successes, ask questions, and keep the momentum going. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nihi Adewale, host of the Akaba Home Financial Freedom Mastermind Group, and I'm excited to be joining you this Wednesday, just ahead of June 1st. And we talked about it, but this is going to be another open session. And in these sessions, I like to kick it off with a topic and a focus point of something that's just on my mind and something that can hopefully help you out as well. And one of the things that um, kind of came to mind this week is a saying that I always repeat to myself. And if you've been around me enough, you've probably heard me say this, but control what you can control and let the rest fall where it may, right? And where this came from and the roots of that kind of saying that I say to myself is I used to work in medical sales and medical device sales can be a high stress environment. And there's a lot of things that are out of your control. Whether or not the customer chooses you based on a whole bunch of myriad of reasons, is largely out of your control. What you can control in that situation is if you presented your product correctly and if you put your best foot forward in every interaction to kind of make it happen. And so back when I was in medical sales, there was this really large deal up in the New England area that I was pushing to close. It was one that was really like the largest deal in the country. It was one that could really be a career changer. And throughout that process, a lot of individuals would ask me like, hey, are you nervous? Like, what's going on? Like, you know, you're getting toward the end. They're going to make a decision and, you know, it can go one of two ways. One, you could get the deal and everything's good. Or two, you could lose the deal and, you know, potentially your job's in the line, right? And the thing I kept coming back to was just controlling what I can control. I think it came from even then in like athlete days. But at the end of the day, you stressing or fearing about the result of something is not going to help the result. For example, if you're preparing for a test, what you should do is prepare as hard as you can, do as many practice tests as you can. But when you go into that test, you should be really calm and relaxed because you've put in all the work ahead of time. And then after you get done with that test, don't even think about it. The results are in. You worrying about it is not going to help. The results are the results. Just wait, get the results and kind of go from there. And so that's kind of how I take my day to day, even when I'm working through different deals and larger and larger deals. I just focused on how can I present this in the best possible light? How can we make sure that we're protected as much as possible on all fronts? And then at the end, you got to kind of let it go, man. It'll allow you to have a lot less wrinkles. It'll allow you to be uh, a lot more relaxed and calm in your thinking. And it's one of those things where if you're able to successfully kind of prepare as hard as you can and go after each day as hard as you can with that preparation, it's easy to kind of, you know, uh, not worry about the result as much because you've put in all the work that you can. One of my favorite basketball players was Kobe Bryant. And the reason being is he was not, he had some natural gifts, but he was not as naturally gifted as some of the other players. He just worked really hard in his skills. He was in the gym all the time, kind of practicing, prepping, practicing, prepping. And no, he didn't make every shot, but man, he, he felt confident going up there and taking it. And he took every shot as if he was going to make it because he practiced it. And so that's the word for the day. Control what you can control. Let the rest fall where it may. I hope that helped a little bit. I talked to a couple of newer investors within the last week. And there's when you're getting started in real estate, there's a lot of things that can draw your attention away, right? And it's almost like shiny object syndrome. You can say, oh, man, I want to go get a house hack or I want to go get my first investment property. But now I want to know about, hey, how am I going to save on taxes with cost segregations? But hey, how does the LLC piece fit into this? And th the best thing that you can do when you're getting started in any new venture is to really focus in and take it one step at a time, right? The first step before all the other you know, LLCs and cost segregations and all that stuff comes into effect, 
It's just acquiring the first property. If you can get that first step down and acquire the first property, then it opens a pathway up to all these other strategies that are going to allow you to take even more advantages and kind of maximize that real estate. But the initial step, you don't want to get so overloaded with information that you get froze and kind of paralyzed in your tracks. You want to take that first initial step and purchase the property and then start to look at all these other items. I can tell you from my first couple of years of real estate investing, it was pretty bread and butter, right? It was 2016 through 2020. All I really bought was single family or no, with small multifamily, right? So two to four unit properties. And I bought it all within a one mile radius of each other in the same street and city. And I just kept going back to the wheelhouse, back to the wheelhouse, back to the wheelhouse. Cause I knew, okay, now I'm able to use some of the learnings from the last one on this one. My numbers are getting tighter. I'm able to get more. I know exactly what it can pull in because the last house was pulling in X amount. I've got the contractors in place that can fix this piece up and kind of make it nicer and, and get it going. And you're able to use some of the learnings that you have from the past to accelerate quickly. Whereas a, a lot of individuals like to jump from strategy to strategy. My whole thing is focus on one strategy until you can master it and then move on to the next. So that was my bread and butter up until 2020. And then I moved into that short-term rental space. And now that's kind of what I've been focused on for the past two and a half, three years and plan to continue to focus on that until we can expand out of state and hopefully out of country. And then we're going to have the syndicate piece, right? The piece that we're working on in Louisville, Kentucky, where we have the townhomes and the storage getting built. And that's going to be another adventure that we're going to kind of take on and be able to learn from. But again, it started with the bread and butter doing that for, you know, four and a half, five years doing just that same small multifamily and then moving into other adjacencies along the way. Alpha, it has been a minute, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm super good. You're looking very astutious today. Oh, thank with you. With the glasses on, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Got some new glasses recently. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask, how was the build day this past Monday? I couldn't attend. I kind of had some things come up. Dude, it was amazing. So the build day was pretty cool. It was actually smooth. Everybody showed up on time, which was awesome. And we knocked it out in probably like three hours or less. If somebody was here that is online that is from the build day, please keep me honest on that. I think we knocked it out in three hours or less. And that property is actually going to go live officially in about a week. There's just a couple handyman items that we got to take care of. Last couple pictures to hang that just arrived. But it was pretty smooth, man. And we got plenty coming up. So believe me, there'll be more opportunity for build days. Okay, okay. All right, sounds good. I guess my next question is, I know the rates have been kind of creeping up. How has the selling real estate business and buying real estate business been going in Atlanta? Man, it's been, so regardless of rates and outside the pandemic, typically the high season is spring and summer. That's when everybody comes out, whether you're doing a rental or whether you're, you know, selling a house, that's the best time to have it go vacant and, and want to do that, right? So a, a quick tip to the side. If you were going to lease properties, you want to have the leases end sometime in the summer so you can lease it up to somebody else for more because that's when people are looking. And if you're going to sell a house, if it's not needed and you don't have to sell it, you want to try to target the spring or the summer to put that thing on the market when you got a lot more people out shopping, families, things of that nature. But it's been good. It's ticked up significantly just because there's all that pent up demand from last year when the interest rates were still going through the roof and we're getting 0.75 in increases. Right now, hopefully it's going to settle down from an interest rate standpoint, but there's a lot of people that are out and about looking because they've been sitting on the sideline for two years waiting for a crash and that crash really hasn't happened. So it's been good, man. It has been good. But what about you, Alpha? Anything that you got going on right now? As you can see from behind me, my wall still hasn't been put up. I have the guy coming in tomorrow to buy some materials to kind of work on that, putting back that wall. And then once that's done, I spoke to insurance sometime last week and I sent them the documents from the tree specialist to try to, I guess, I'm going to go through insurance and then try to have them fight the case so the claim doesn't show up on my record. And that's kind of what it is. I'm kind of waiting for insurance to kind of get back to me on what their next steps are. So besides that, just just those two things, running the Airbnb and uh, just trying to tie up a lot of these loose ends. Dude, this game is a lot of problem solving, and you have done an awesome job of that, just taking it one day at a time and controlling kind of what you can control. 
And it's it's one of those things where there's always going to be these wrenches that are thrown your way. Now, the wrenches that were thrown your way are incredible and a lot bigger than I've seen, especially for a first investment. And so I think you can rest assured that you're going to be an expert on all this stuff by the end of the day. And it's going to help you moving forward. It may not yeah. seem like it now, but I think it'll be a blessing in disguise a couple of years from now. Yeah, I think once I finish those two issues and I fix the road and the trees and the gutters and stuff like that, think about once I get my next property and it's like a ten thousand dollar property, like, oh, that's that's light. <laughs> True. So, so definitely, I'm looking forward to moving on. I did want to buy one this year. I was looking like I got too much things to pay for, so maybe by end of winter or spring I can start looking again. And another quick tip, right? If you're going to buy a property, if you're able to time it up for that winter time frame, that's usually where there's less buyers, less people want to move in the winter. And so you have the upper hand from that standpoint. So that actually is good timing. I know it's not ideal for kind of what we were looking to do as far as like, hey, once a year, things of that nature. But it's okay to stretch that timeline a little bit just to make sure the home front secured and then kind of go from there. Kind of shifting gears a little bit. I just got the appraisal report back for that quadplex and there's some negotiations that need to happen, right? So I came back about 75K under, which is significant. Ooh. And so obviously the seller's like, hey man, we gotta figure this out. <laughs> and I'm like, hey guys, you know, hey, this is this is the appraisal. So we're working through that. And this is one of those things coming back to what I started this off with, it's kind of why it's on top of my mind. You gotta control what you can control, right? Yeah. So we have all these credits built in. And one of the reasons I push so hard to negotiate- You say 75K under, Meaning that you're going to pay 800000 but it's worth seven twenty five. dollars Exactly. So okay. I had it under contract for eight seventy five. dollars The appraisal came back at eight oh one, dollars mm -hmm. uh, And so there's a, a $74,000 gap, right? Yeah. And I'm not coming out of pocket for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the cool things like that you can do up front is there's really three phases to a negotiation. One is just getting the property under contract. You've got to get it under contract before the power can shift to you because there's other people out there that they're analyzing you against. Once you get under contract, you've got the due diligence negotiation for any repairs that you see. And then you've got the appraisal contingency negotiation, right? And then you also have, if there's anything financing that's potentially a concern, you can negotiate some things there and actually switch up the financing during that contingency period and lock it in to where you still have some protection. But this appraisal contingency is really the last one. I'm supposed to close next Friday. And this is why we always like have this one as your last one, because at this point, the seller is bought in to this as well. Like they're licking their chops, like, man, we're going to get a huge check in about a week and a half. Right. Mm -hmm. But if they have to go back to the market, it's going to take at least another 30 days. Right. If somebody goes under contract immediately. And so, you know, I want the property, but then they want to get the property sold. So we got to come to some common ground. Thankfully, mm -hmm. we negotiated some credits up front. And so there is potentially a little give and take here. Because that is a big gap for them to say, hey, we're just going to chop off 74K of the dollars mm -hmm. that we were supposed to get. But we're going to make it happen, man. We're going to make it happen. That fourplex is, it's looking good. There's just some updates that need to be made. We talked about 10K. I think I'm going to need to put about 25 per unit into it mm -hmm. to update kitchens, bathrooms, a little bit of flooring, and like some paint. But it'll be worth it in the end to be able to bump those rents up. And so right now, I'm really looking at properties that, hey, I want to hold for a long time because I'm big on the metro of Atlanta continuing to grow, especially with, you know, events like the Olympics coming here and things of that nature. I think it's only going to get bigger, only going to get more exposure. And all the companies that are planting their flags here, it's just good. It's all around good prospects for the city. Okay. But any questions from the chat? Anybody else want to jump in? Fair enough. Alpha, I meant to say this before. Thanks for coming to the event the other week, man. It was awesome seeing you there. It was a cool event. Uh, and we're hoping to get some more of these going at least once a year, but probably a little more frequently. No, Ricardo had a good time. I had an awesome time and it was great seeing everybody. And I hope that the information was impactful. And it's just good to be able to get around that energy again, right? The pandemic kind of pushed a lot of those meetings out. I used to go to the RIA meetings actually in Boston, as well as in Louisville, when I lived there, I haven't actually been to a RIA meeting here, but I'm going to start getting out and going to those as well, because it is pretty exciting to see people in person. Desmond, how you doing? What's up, man? I'm good. How are you? 
Super good. Super good. And happy Wednesday. Hold on. Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm good. My bad. I was switching over. What's up? Not much, man. Not much. How you doing? Doing good. I mean, I'm doing good. Just just not getting off of work. Working those West Coast hours, so a little on a, on a later schedule. Hey, uh, come on now. But you get to start later, too. West Coast, they, hey, they, they be sleeping in, man. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, especially in tech, too, right? Like, I don't start until, like, 10 o'clock West Coast time, which is, like, 1 o'clock here. So, definitely That's nice. That's pretty sweet. That yeah. is pretty cool. I can tell you, when I was in Hawaii for a bit, when I was working corporate, and the coolest thing about it, one, I mean, your phone starts ringing super early because Hawaii is like two hours behind right. LA, right? But you're done at noon. At noon, it's 5 p.m. East Coast time. It's like, all right, hey, I'm, I'm good. Now you're surfing. You got the whole day ahead of you. So yeah, no, it's definitely pretty cool. But what you got oh, going on, sure. man? Anything new? Yeah, man. So let's see. When was the meetup? I'm trying to remember. Was it last two week? Two weeks, weeks ago. ago. Mm-hmm. Two weeks ago. Yeah. Time flies. So let's see. At the meetup, I had mentioned to some folks that I was starting with like the arbitrage, right? And I had just gotten approved for an apartment and it was actually right down the street. It was a, let's see, two bed, one bath and like a small little gated community. It was going for think like 1550 and it also had laundry as well but long story short that ended up falling through and basically i thought they were going to be okay with not only the subleasing but allowing me to do short-term rental right and it turns out that they were they would be okay with that to an extent and i had kind of like like wave my hand over that kind of starting off when I was doing the tour because I just figured like because they seem to be okay with it that they would just not really care too much but it turns out they did actually care and they were kind they were kind of okay with the subleasing but they would only allow it basically if I imposed like a three-week minimum for the guests right because it's a small little gated community I think it's like 22 units total private owner so they want to they wanted to keep the traffic at a minimum right and didn't want basically other guests in the community complaining which made sense like totally you know understand that so that one ended up falling through but i think this is a piece on like making relationships and just kind of like following up right so i you know was like okay that's fine but you know keep me in mind if you have any other ones right and even before that i had kind of built up a good rapport with the landlord and whatnot and it turns out she actually had another unit that was also available and this one is actually a single family home and it's on the west side so a little farther from me like the other ones were just down the street at first like two or three minutes away here in college park but this new one is like in the West side and closer to like Bankhead area. But yeah, so it's a single family home, three bed, three bath. And the cool part is that all the bath, all the bedrooms have in suite bathrooms. Mm. So I think it'll do really well if I wanted to rent by the room. Um, but basically that same landlord is okay with allowing me to do short term rental out of the single family home. Cause it's not in the community. They don't have to worry about the neighbors nearly as much. Right. And it's just like, I'm just renting the house and, you know, just having guests over the way they see it. So it turns out that it's available and it was actually available last week, but I had just missed it and they were going to sign another guy. And I told him, hey, it's okay. Keep me in mind still. And that guy fell through. So kind of after all that long process, it looks like I toured the unit this morning. It looks like I'm going to get like a proof of the lease and kind of start start the lease with that unit or with that house. So that's super exciting. I was like super hyped to to see that text come through because I was kind of bummed that I was missing out on that one because it's a, it's a three bed, three bath. I think it has laundry. I need to make sure on that. But it's furnished. And ah. that's, the, that's the crazy piece, right? So that is what made me like instantly want to hop on it. And I didn't even really have to think about it too much. I was like, let's go. Because like, you know, if shit hits the fan – Worst comes to worst, I'll break the lease, right? Pay maybe the month or two months that the lease will probably require and like cut my losses and leave, right? But when you bring your own furniture, I think this is kind of what, I think we talked about this a little bit, right? Where the arbitrage piece gets a little risky is like if the landlord decides, hey, they don't want you as a tenant anymore, like shit hits the fan. Now I got to figure out 
what do I do with my furniture? And especially for a three, three, I'm going to have like a lot of furniture and a lot of shit. Right. So that was something I like was kind of worried about with the arbitrage piece, but with the fact that it's furnished, like for me makes it a no brainer. The rent's going for about 1800 or 1850. And she's even going to try to get it down a little lower for me. She said, which I thought was awesome. And yeah, the projected it's looking at a little over three grand is what it says. So we'll see. Dude, first and foremost, congrats. And thank you. That's awesome. Perseverance kind of taking it one day at a time and, and still fighting to make it happen and building that relationship. And I'm pumped for you because getting a fully furnished spot, is there any type of furniture that you need to put in to, to make it pop or is it, is it ready to rock from that standpoint? There's going to be some stuff that we need to bring in. I think the biggest piece is going to be like TVs. Like I think they have mounts on the wall, but they don't actually have like the actual TV in there. So I think that's going to be the biggest piece of like actual furniture we need to bring in. But like the, Bigger items, couches, beds, even the mattresses are already provided. So, like, linens and stuff, obviously, I'll need to supply. But pretty much all of, like, the big pieces, the couches, you know, chairs and whatnot, dining table is already supplied, which I walked in earlier and I was like, wow. It, it, I got giddy looking at that because I was like, man, this is amazing. No, that is pretty cool. We are pumped for you. And I definitely want to hear kind of how the arbitrage piece goes. Yeah. I think you've already mitigated the risk though. Like with just having to put down the security deposit, you've already got the rents kind of figured out and the rents aren't crazy. For some of the people that I've talked to that are doing arbitrage, like Midtown, things of that nature, they're paying like 2,300 plus 25% of what they make, which Jeez. doesn't make any sense at that point. Like Jesus. you literally have to go clean your own unit to make money there. Right. I'm like, hey man. <laughs> which you know I'm willing sense. to do. <laughs> hey, I know that, but hey, you don't want to start off like that, right? You want to have the right. option. And so to that point, it sounds like it's going to be awesome. And I think the whole group would be very interested in kind of how that goes moving forward. Absolutely. But AJ, how you doing? What's up, AJ? You on mute? Maybe on mute. Yes, we can. Yep. What's Super up, good. Boss, man? Hey, come on now. We're trying to make it happen one day at a time, man. And we got... One question in the chat from Angie, and Angie, welcome. I know this is your first call. What are some rules? I'm going to kick this to the group. What are some rules and regulations to look out for when renting out rooms or in-law suites in a single-family home? And Desmond, you were just talking about potentially doing rent by the room. Have you looked into this? And can you float the question one more time? I'm sorry. I was actually texting the landlord that I was mentioning. She, Absolutely. She just me. What are some rules and regulations to look out for when renting out rooms or in-law suites in a single family home? So that's a good question. One that I've heard about and actually the landlord had mentioned to me is like the max number of people that can occupy a space. And I'll admit I'm not the expert here, so maybe Nee, you could chime in, but I know that there are limits, right? As to like how many people can be in a space. And I know that that might also relate to like the zoning, right? So Again, I'm not the expert here, but I know that if you are trying to like, you know, maximize the number of, I guess, people you can have in the space and like maximize the amount of, you know, I guess, yeah, bodies, you know, that you have, that's something that I think you might want to keep in mind. And like one check that the zoning allows for that. I think maybe it's like allowing for like multi or something like that. Again, maybe you could chime in, but also I know that there's some sort of, you know, hard cap on just how many people you can have in like a, in a house. Well, yeah. I have one quick comment. I actually just finished my short-term rental program, and I've submitted that. It was a lot of documents, and uh, I messed up one document. I didn't include the address of my neighbors when I sent the letter to them. So I got to redo that part. But um, I know in that permit for Atlanta, they say you're allowed to have two guests per room. So that's kind of all I know, but there may be more rules I don't know about. I just know from that short-term rental permit, they say two guests per room. AJ, you got anything on that? All you guys were spot on in terms of short-term rental piece, right? In city of Atlanta and in most cities, it's two guests per bedroom. That's the limit from a short-term rental perspective, right? So that's actually pretty liberal. It doesn't matter if these guests know each other, right? They should know each other if they're booking together, but it doesn't matter. It's just two guests per bedroom is the max. So if you have five bedrooms, you have 10 guests. And so that's why when you're running like air DNA calculations, you want to look at the number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms. And then when it asks you for number of guests, you want to just do two times the number of bedrooms just to be safe, right? And kind of go from there. So that's STRs. Now, when you look at long-term rentals, and I'm actually getting back into my long-term rental bag, I actually 
re-signed up for the software called Buildium, which is how I used to manage my long-term rentals back in the day. I haven't used it for years, but I'm coming back to it because I'm closing in that fourplex and there's three long-term rentals that I got to kind of figure out. I'm getting, all, I'm getting all the systems in place. So you can ask me about that a little bit later. Also getting lawyers ready for quote unquote evictions that may happen down the road, hoping they don't, but getting all that stuff set up because you need it now because I'm going to be managing this. But for long-term rentals, the restriction, there are restrictions. You do have to look it up by county. I couldn't tell you, Angie, unless you know what county you're looking at, I couldn't really tell you. And I'd probably have to look it up myself because I haven't done long-term rentals out here yet until this new venture. But typically they limit how many unrelated persons can occupy a space, especially for a single family. So I know, you know, like in, in Boston, while I was living up there, there were certain limits to how many people, you know, can occupy a space. It's based on the number of bedrooms as well, but they just don't want a bunch of unrelated people living in essentially like a border house um, because it can lead to issues, things of that nature down the road. So there's two sets of rules. Short-term rental is pretty cut and dry, two guests per bedroom. For long-term rentals, it's more unrelated persons that are living in a space. Hope that helped Angie. Okay, perfect. Anything? Hmm? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think to that standpoint, like when I'm looking at all the regulations, I just want it to be fair for both sides, right? I think everybody on here, we're not looking to run a party house. We see more than two guests per bedroom showing up. Yeah, I think we're all ringing the alarm like, hey, man, <laughs> what are you doing? But there are individuals that like run their B&Bs kind of just, you know, haphazardly. And so if we're able to rule those guys out, that's cool. But the first proposed plans that the city had, which was around, hey, you have to be an owner occupant and you can only own two. That was a bit strict, right? Thankfully, they've now refined that. And what's proposed now, I'm actually good with, especially if we get grandfathered in, which is basically saying you don't have to be an owner occupant. They're only going to limit it to X amount of short term rentals per city block or per 2000 square feet or X percentage within the city. And they're still trying to figure that piece out that I'm good with. And also the whole point of getting licensed is so that they can keep track of any violations like party violations that hit you. So if you hit, you know, three party violations in the year, they can shut it down. That's cool. But I'm with you. It's, a, it's definitely a, a line that we have to tow. I'm just happy that they're starting to listen to some of the hosts and not take such a hard line saying, hey, you've got to be an owner occupant and things of that nature. But we've got two questions in the chat. The first one from James. Have you used Rent Ready? My problem is convincing midterm tenants to download another app, sign up through it, and to make payments. So that's a little bit tough. It depends on where you're getting the midterm rental tenants from. To answer your first question, no, I haven't used Rent Ready. I've used Zillow Rent Manager, which is free, and I've used Buildium. Buildium was the first thing that I knew back in 2016. Um, it's paid. I think you pay, I think I'm going to pay like $50 a month, something like that for it. And I like it because it's a comprehensive system. I can list properties for long-term rentals there, take maintenance requests there. You can message guests through there. They can send their messages. You can do your application through their credit background check. You can send your lease through there. And it kind of all keeps in a system to where if you ever need to go back and refer to something and say, hey, where's my history trail? The reason like we all use you know, these apps, Airbnb, things of that nature, and they like us to keep messages within there is because you have a trail and now you can, you know, legally, if you need to do something, you have that trail to go back to. That's the same reason I like using Buildium because it's a solid software. I heard that Rent Ready is pretty similar. I just haven't used it. When you talk about convincing midterm rental tenants to go and use another system, it depends on how you're getting them, right? If you're getting them through like Airbnb or VRBO and then trying to convert them over to another system, that may be difficult. It may be better to just book them through that website. And then once you book them, you're going to get their contact information. Just give them a call, shoot them a text, right? Set up some time and talk to them about coming to direct. That's that's kind of what we do. Now, if you're getting them from like a furnished finder and things of that nature, that you should be able to control. Now, from a rent ready standpoint, they're getting a stipend, right? I typically take them through our direct site. I don't even bother kind of doing like the lease agreements and things of that nature, unless it's going to be like a year when it's typically three months or less, I will just take them through our direct site, which works very similar to Airbnb and try to book them there and then kind of build that relationship and maybe switch them over after that. Any other comments or thoughts on that from like midterm rental guests? Alpha Desmond? Yeah, I haven't, 
I haven't used rent ready, but I could see where, you know, that would be an issue trying to kind of convert them over. Like you said, I would say if it's like on Airbnb or booking, you shouldn't have a problem because like they have their own payment processor. Right. And I think that's, that's where hospitable becomes helpful to like be able to set up like the direct kind of offering that they have now. If you don't have that, I would say the next best thing that I would probably go and do is at least set up a Stripe and have them pay through there or have them, I would have them pay through some online payment processor. And even if you just get down to, I don't know how comfortable you would be accepting it through like cash app or through Zelle. I take payments like that for some of my midterm guests that I've had. That's a little bit, that's a little less formal and those guests I've had some rapport with, but yeah, I would say I would at least have a Stripe if you don't have something like Hospitable Direct. I'll also throw out the management software that I use, which is Turbo Tenant, which I found to be super helpful. It's free for some of the basic stuff, just like collecting money, messaging, maintenance requests. And I've been able to, I only have one long-term tenant, so it's pretty easy, right? But I've been able to manage her with this free software. And then I do have a paid version where you can do like applications and screening and stuff. And that's only eight bucks a month. So I wanted to throw that out there. Cause I know, I know you mentioned building me is like, I think for more kind of advanced solutions and uh, bigger portfolios. And I think since you, you only have the four, you could maybe explore like a, a less beefy one or less Dude, expensive at least. Desmond, you are absolutely right. And this comes back to kind of path of least resistance. This is why all these companies are so good, man. Like I'm, Excellent. we're not going to switch away from Apple because everything's right. linked in there. It's like, Hey, right. <laughs> it would take forever to try to switch this over to an Android, even if they're charging X amount. And so Buildium is what I grew up using. It was before Zillow rent manager, before rent ready, before all the other guys. And now they've started to focus more on actual property management companies. So they, they, they're, it's a lot less of the little guy. It used to be a lot cheaper. So I say all this to say I'm going with them because I, I recognize them before. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's fair. So I'm going to pay an extra $42 a month just because the, the brand recognition. And, hey, I can probably relearn this a lot quicker. Um, hey, you got it, though. That's the benefit <laughs> of being the boss. Right? Hey, come on now. No. <laughs> AJ, what you got? Anything on that piece with the rent ready? Yeah. I'm just so going to say. Oh, Please, no, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say for hospitable, I'll shoot you my, my offer link. Cause I know you get the, they do the referral. All right, Desmond, <laughs> let, let me, let me try to take a shot at answering the question. <laughs> I just want to say that first before Nick gets his answer. Hey, so you got it. Out there. You get, uh, uh, Desmond, you can shoot that referral link. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it's two different. So uh, for you, because you're going to be looking to short term, midterm rent, both of these, you would want to lean more toward hospitable because that's a site that's built for that. It's really for short-term rentals. You're able to automate a lot of the messaging. And if somebody asks you about parking, you can automatically have a message that goes out. If they ask you about Wi-Fi, automatically a message goes out. The other system is more for a long-term rental, right? Because hospitable would be tough to manage a long-term rental because you wouldn't have lease agreements in there. You wouldn't be able to send an application through there. Right. So they're two kind of separate softwares. If you're leaning more towards short term, midterm, Hospitable is an awesome software for that. And that's all I've been using in Atlanta so far. But if you're looking to do more long term, like, hey, I'm going to sign a 12 month lease uh, where somebody's going to have, you know, maintenance concerns that, you know, things of that nature, or I'm going to need to make sure I have the lease impacted in there. Hey, they pay on the first, but if they're late three days, there's going to be late charges added. It'd be hard to do it through a short-term rental management software. You'd want to look more into Rent Ready, build a Zillow Rent Manager. So it's two separate, two separate things. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I would definitely say you need to have them separate. And like I said too, like just for the one long-term tenant I have, I use Turbo Tenant, and that's worked out great. I know Rent Ready is another one. Buildium, there's a like million you know long-term tenant, especially property management softwares. And I would say I tried out a couple of them and what's helpful is a lot of them have trials or at least like free versions of the of the website right so definitely use that to your advantage because it kind of gives you a feel for you know do you like the website do you like the ui is it is it going to be you know beneficial for you and then also i would say in terms of like just yeah choosing your stack for me it was mostly word of mouth and i honestly mostly went with what kind of knee mentioned hospitable is an absolute beast I would be, I'd be screwed without that. So I would definitely recommend hospitable, at least try out the trial. Guesty is another one that's, that I know is super popular. And there are a few other ones too, that are like, I think on the same 
playing field kind of all competitors, right? So if you just Google short-term rental software, they'll come up. But hospitable for sure, I would say, is like one of the best. Turbo Tenant for me is super is super nice for the long-term rental. And then other kind of software pieces as well. I use Price Labs for the dynamic pricing. Um, and I think they compete with like Air DNA does some dynamic pricing. And there's, I think, Beyond one called pricing. dynamic pricing. Beyond pricing is what it's called. Yeah. So that's another one that's popular. I've started to use like DocuSign or si- Sign Request is another kind of like signing website just for like some of my midterm guests and signing agreements. Since my like management software, my long term management software doesn't come with that. So I've tried to kind of, you know, outsource that. But yeah, other than that, I would say word of mouth and like trying them out is definitely super helpful. That is pretty awesome. The only other step I would take when it comes to like longer term contracts is you should pay the money to take it to a lawyer, have them look through it. It'll cost you 250 to 500, best money you've ever spent. Just to make sure you're on track and you're not leaving out anything. I've adapted my my long-term rental documents over and over for Louisville. And now, you know, I need to kind of go through that process for, for Georgia. I've been kind of sidetracked with a lot of stuff, but I'm trying to set aside some time this week and actually dig into that because I'm like, dude, we're closing in a week. So I got to actually be ready to roll because <laughs> I'm not going to be able to hand this to somebody else this time. Um, so it's it's getting back in the trenches, which would be fun. And we'll talk about this. But we have one question in the chat that I definitely wanted to get to. And it's from Eva. Eva, welcome to your first Financial Freedom Mastermind group. But the question is, have any of you borrowed against a life insurance policy for interest-free money to invest in real estate? Do you know the nuances of how this works? And I just popped into the the chat a YouTube link to a guest that you may remember we had on episode 50, Adam Carroll, who was talking all about this. That's literally how he built his fortune. But anybody, do any of you guys have any experience with this or do you have life insurance policies? Have you looked into this? Anyone? Yeah, same. I've I've heard a lot about it. And when I first heard about it, I got super excited because anytime, anytime I hear the term interest-free money, I perk up. I'm like, let, let me get some of that, right? Other people's money is nice. I think that the step down from that is interest-free money. So I haven't done a life insurance policy. I did take a loan on a 401k, which I think is a kind of similar strategy, right? Where you're kind of borrowing against money you already have. And I think with the life insurance policy, definitely with the 401k loan, you pay back interest, but that interest that you pay back is to yourself. So in a way, I saw it as like a risk-free way to basically fast track my way into real estate. And that's, it, it's essentially what it's become. And I don't, I haven't really seen too much loss or downside, especially with how the market's been so crazy over the past year or so in taking that loan. And that was super helpful in helping me get the fourplex. So I would, I would say if you already have that policy, oh, and I saw, I see you say you signed up for it just recently. So I would say if you, you have the policy already, since you've only done it within two months, you might not have enough kind of cash built up there to borrow from it yet. But I would say when you do have that cash built up or if you do if you do have that money now, I would say seriously consider doing that because it can be a way to kind of have access to capital that you would otherwise not be able to access and otherwise be restricted and there'll be a lot of penalties for you to access, which I think is the case for life insurance as well. The, the only one pitfall that's with the 401k loan is if you happen to leave whatever company that you're with before you pay back the loan, they automatically cash out your money and then draw mm-hmm. your money. So I think it's going to depend on your servicer as well. Cause I think with my 401k loan, that's not the case. I think I can just pay back. But it, yeah. if, if I, if I screw up that payback at any time, it's going to become a cash out. Yeah. As long as you pay it back, let's say you borrow 12,000 yeah. and then you leave your job and get filed within six months, you have to pay that money back immediately. But if you know you're going to be there for the job for the length of the loan, then you're fine. That's the only thing that, cause I did a lot, took out a small loan on my 401k also. So. So that's the only thing I'm saying. So if you know you're going to be there for like the next three to four years, it's enough time to pay back the loan, you're fine. But if you're planning to maybe leave that company within six months, you have to pay it back or they're going to cash it out. And you take the, I think there's a 20% penalty for cashing out your 401k early. And then you take that also. So it's like double whammy. But, but yeah, I took out a small one also. But, but if you know you're going to be there for a while, it's definitely a good way to pull out cash and be able to, 
kind of recycle that cash and use it again. Absolutely. And you said 20% penalty plus it's going to count as income. So you're getting. Yeah, I don't know what the penalty is, but I know there's a penalty if you cash out your 401k or you don't take out before 65. I'm looking now, it's 10%. 10%, 10%. yeah. So they still they have it out, out, considering you're going to them, And then you lose 10%. So let's say you take out, because I think they allow you to take out to 50% of your 401k and you could do a five year payment plan. And actually, you can actually buy a home with it and it's a 15 year payment 15 plan. 15 year term. Yeah, but the problem with that one was you basically have to get the documents saying that you're buying the house beforehand. Then they approve. It basically makes the buying process a lot longer. So you might as well take out the five year one or the three year one, and obviously the payments is more aggressive, but you get your money. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't find that right. It didn't, and me maybe you could speak to this too. I don't, and if you remember, I don't think it stretched out our closing time at all. I just had to do it kind of at the right time, and I had to really make sure. I requested that money at the right time and also that they were going to disperse it at the right time. So I had to talk to Fidelity say, hey, it's going to be in my account on Wednesday, right? Because I'm, I'm going to the closing table on Friday. Okay. So if it's not there, I'm going to be looking real silly, right? Because I told the these folks. One? The home buyer one? Did you do the home buyer one for 15 years? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I did the home buyer one. So my payment right now out of my check is like 100 bucks, and I took like 20 k over 15 years. Yeah. I'm actually about to pay it back to them and take a – the max that you can take, I think, yeah. I, I think I'm going to do it. Take 50 K because like I'm seeing decent gains, but I'm seeing better gains and just doing my, you know, short -term my short-term rental. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So I'm probably going to repay them, take another one like the week after and then hit up need to get a duplex, maybe something bigger. So mm -hmm. we'll see. So it, it literally, so what they do is at least for my 401k plan, they pull out the money and they put it in a cash value on the side. As you make your $100 payments, they take $100 from your cash value, you put it back into your 401k. There's a little bit extra than the interest that you're paying yourself for borrowing your own money. So all of the money goes back to you. Which sounds so silly. Yeah. You got to pay yourself interest for borrowing your money. <laughs> for borrowing. I guess what they're saying is because you're out of the market in that time, you pay interest kind of covering how much money you make while being in the market. Into the payment, yeah. So if you take out like 10000 then 6% over three years, they do the math, and then they break it up into the 60 payments and some things of that nature, yeah. You choose that yourself. Well, so the term can differ though, right? So if you use it for a home purchase, yeah. then you're eligible for a 15-year term, up to 15 years, right? If you use it for anything else, then you're eligible for up to five years on, yeah. on the term. Yeah. So I would definitely recommend using it for a home so, purchase if you know you can. So me personally, I was worried about the 15 year one not getting approved in time. So I just did the five year one and you get the money like the next day, no questions asked. But Desmond just showed me that within 30 days you'll get the money. So I was like, okay. I, well, yeah, I got it within like three or four days, but I did have to submit like a couple of documents related to the purchase. Now they weren't like the final, final closing documents, because we hadn't gone to the closing table yet, right? But So we were like, I requested like a week before, but I had some documents yeah. still to show that I was closing so that I was able to submit it. But once I gave that, they, they turned yeah. it over within like a day or two. Yeah. And that's yeah. Fidelity specifically. Yeah, but once I heard that, I was like, man, I don't, I already heard the financing process is so complicated. I didn't want to muck it up even more, even though mine went extremely smoothly. But uh, yeah, it's either the five years or the 15 years if you could do Desmond's way and do the homeowner one. And then if you if you think about it too, like you're paying yourself that six percent percent interest back. I mean, most people aren't doing better than like ten, fifteen percent max. Fifteen percent's a lot. So like, ten percent is seen as a like good return, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, and a lot of people are doing worse than that. And I think right now, especially so. So I was listening to a podcast the other day that was saying taking a four hundred one k loan in like a you know negative downturn could almost be better than being in the market in your 401k. And you should keep in mind too, that money you're loaning out, AJ, you're not making gains on, right? So they kind of set it aside out of your 401k. Yeah. But you're, you're still able to contribute to your 401k while you have that loan. Got it. And that's the last thing to add on. That's, I'm really big into stuff. So I knew that the market was turning around that time. All my indicators said the market's going down. So when I pulled out my money in September, it was like two months into it crashing. So I watched it go down. Then I paid back most of it before February. So I'm catching all the gains, but I kind of, even though you should never time the market, I kind of timed right. the market and just kind of hit the right time where literally I sold at the high, slowly bought in at the low, bought back in, and now my 401k is higher. You get what I'm saying?
So it worked out perfectly that way. And then the money was there. So as long as you're taking the money out to do something productive with it, it's good. But if you're taking it out to buy Chanel bags, then it's like. <laughs> Unless you're flipping the <laughs> Chanel bags. <laughs> it's nah, that's a hard flip, man. That's a hard flip. <laughs> I heard handbags are actually one of the like rare, like, Assets that keep their own value, which is crazy. Yeah, now you get yeah, it. And appreciate I'm it. gonna let you try it out first, and then yeah. kind of bring the wealth of knowledge. I'll let y'all know. You, you just you <laughs> gotta get it low enough. You get it low enough. It's always a deal. There you go. <laughs> yeah. No, but got- man, you said it. That right there was it for me. I was trying to be rich yesterday. <laughs> Definitely not when I'm 65. You know what I'm saying? So that that was it for me. I was like, yeah, I'm taking it. <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing when you pull out equity out of a property. If you take the equity and you blow it, or you take it to do something productive with it. And I think going to everything that I read, buying real estate, long-term investing, and uh, buying stocks, they're kind of like this and this. That's why there's a lot of people who buy stuff people about real estate. But the thing is, when you put it into a short-term rental, now you put it into real estate with a cash flowing business inside. And that's what really makes it good. Because now you buy real estate with the tax benefits and appreciation. There's also, now you have a cash flowing business that's generating you cash. And that's where the real taking them dollars really multiplies. But just based on what I read, I know he's a real estate guy, but like <laughs> buying stocks, S&P 500 and buying real estate, they average between 6 and 10% for the most part. Yeah. Come on now. Hey, we here. <laughs> but to that point, I know I'm mostly real estate, but I still do do the vanguards, you know, and kind of have X amount go each month. I still do this high yield savings accounts. I may not be an expert over there. I haven't pulled, you know, insurance policies or 401ks, but I've definitely thought about it. And one other strategy that we can definitely get into at another time that I've been thinking about a lot more, uh, especially as I'm going through this syndicate process, we have an investor that's looking to put about 100K into the syndicate. And they're going to be using a self-directed IRA, which is basically when you switch your 401k to a self-directed IRA, and now you can kind of choose where you want to put it. Uh, And they've done this multiple times before with different syndicates because they can get a higher return and then plug that back in for retirement, things of that nature. I'm looking into that. I'm looking into doing something like that. I kind of like that option a lot because I did build up a good amount while in the corporate world. And now it's just sitting there. And to your point, AJ, right? You know, can't pull it till 65 or there's multiple penalties and it just doesn't look good. Um, but maybe we can grow this thing. And my vision for it is not to, you know, that's the point where we get wealthy. You should be building that along the way and kind of having fun and things of that nature. But my vision for it is to be able to maybe pass that money on, or mm-hmm. maybe you have a bunch of debts on real estate and you just knock everything out with a million dollars from a 401k once you cash it, you know, or maybe you put it into reserve. I don't know. But I want to continue to have that thing work alongside everything else as we continue on this journey. But any thoughts on that before we end for the night? We got about three minutes left. I've heard about the self directed IRA. It's it's not something I've looked into myself, but I think as time continues to go on, as I, as I continue like take out more mortgages, I'm going to increasingly be looking at ways to unlock capital that I have built up. Right. In hopes of e- either doing as well as the market that that capital is currently in or better than the market, because I'll say like I do I do all of the, you know, index funds and ETFs, and all the acronyms. Right. We said it, I think, a couple of times ago, all the acronyms. Right. But at the end of the day, and I think now that the first purchase has gone well and I was able to do that with the 401k loan, you know, to your point, AJ, like. I want to use that money now. Right. And like, I, I, I think there is value in like preparing for the future and setting aside some for, you know, later on. But I think at a certain point you realize, okay, I, I've done my setting aside and I have, you know, a nice little lump sum and that those dollars are deployed and they're working. Right. So let's see if I can take a little bit of that and make those dollars go work harder. And if I see that I can, let's take a little bit more of that and make those dollars work even harder. Right. And I think eventually all, you know, maybe one day I end up, just eating the penalty because I know I can do better than the 10% return that I'm getting, right? I'm not there yet, but, you know, who knows? Yeah. I know, well, Nihi, with your self-directed IRA, that was basically your form of was converted after you left, right? It's not converted yet. In okay, okay. transparency, I haven't touched it because I've just been focused on a whole bunch of other stuff. Wow. But it's something I'm thinking about heading into next year. Each year yeah. I try to challenge myself to do one thing that's different. Like, hey, I've never done this before. Let me try to go do it. And so... There's a good amount of money trapped in that. 
not trapped. It's still growing. There's a good amount of money that's in that that I would like to unlock and a self-directed IRA. Like one of the things you can invest in that is other people's deals. It can't yeah. be your deal. You can't have any involvement whatsoever, but you can invest in other people's deals. There's a plenty of syndicates across my desk. There's plenty of partners and people I know that are in real estate, even you guys that are out there doing it. And you can invest in other people's deals and get returns and put that back in and kind of grow that rapidly. And so it's something I'm thinking about. Nice. But guys, we are going to wrap for the night. I appreciate the spirited conversation and definitely learn some knowledge from the 401k draws and kind of how you can use that to accelerate. But no, I hope you guys continue to have an awesome week as we head into June. Keep your goals in mind. Keep taking it one day at a time. And I will catch you a little bit later. All right, peace, fellas. Catch y'all later. Take it easy.